Good day and welcome. My name is Steffi Sear and this is your Aromatherapy Deep Tissue Massage Certification Program. I'd like to start by welcoming you to a healthy choice, to choosing something that is serving in helping others. So wonderful for our health, our family's health, our friend's health, and our community's health. So everyone, thank you. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to review the components to certify, and then we'll go into an aromatherapy lecture, and we'll talk about uh, where oils come from, what is the definition of essential oils, and prish and rice, so dealing with pain, redness, and mobility, swelling, and heat with rest, ice, compress, and elevate. And we'll also talk about how to make a perfume today. All right, so let's get started. The three components are really four, three or four components to certifying. One is to complete 55 clinical massages and submit your paperwork on that. So you'll have a health history in your package as well as a feedback form for your client and a form for you that addresses the home care advice, the essential oils that you use, the carrier oils that you used, and what cautions and contraindications there were and what massage techniques you used. So that'll really help you over the course of these 55 clinicals become a lot more confident with your practice and with how to modify your practice for what your client is presenting with that day. Your second piece is a blending assignment and the blending assignment is 10 questions that are really common conditions that a lot of your clients will probably have and so we're just looking for the same thing. What essential oils would you choose and why? Uh, actually you don't even have to put why. Come to think about it, you have a template here and it's really about point form. So I know that you're saying it's because of this that I chose this. So which essential oils? It'll say how many points in the um, chart that you get for each question. So I think there's 10 points per question and the blending assignment will be something like you have a woman coming in with menopause that's depressed and needs to be uplifted and has really dry skin. And then so you'll say, okay, for my essential oils, there's three points. Two points come from the oils and one point comes from the carrier oil that you choose. So you might choose, let's say, and there's an example in there for you, so you don't have to record any of this example, but um, let's say for menopause, you decided to choose geranium and clary sage, two wonderful oils for menopause. Um, actually, geranium is really high in alcohol and she has dry skin, so I'm going to pull that one out and maybe in its place I'll add one of my favorites which is neroli. I was actually just sniffing it before class this morning because it's really wonderful for stress and anxiety to ground you, keep you calm and it's also one of the safest oils there is. That and rose essential oil are your two safest oils. Um, on that note I realized that I better silence my phone. So your blending assignment there's 10 points that come with each of the 10 questions and yes three points come from the essential oils and the carry oil you'll get two points for rhyming off cautions and contraindications and what modifications you might do also a couple of points for your specialized techniques and then three points for home care advice and home care advice could be anything from um, stretches strengthening exercises diet meditation and mindful practice, eliminating things, incorporating things. So as far as I was just thinking there with sinuses, uh, if you have sinus congestion, we might eliminate carpets if we can or dust um, and we might incorporate more um, bronchial dilators. And so whether that be by putting a couple of non-flowering plants in your bedroom or and also by having maybe um, an, ionize, an ionizer would be fabulous. That's not what I was thinking. Um, a steamer or a distiller, or um, rather, uh, well, don't fuck up a palillo. Uh, heck, I can't even think diffuser. There we go. Thank you. Somebody was screaming at me from the video. Hey, come on, as if you can't think of this word. Sometimes my brain goes to French and I have a, a block with the translation. Anyways, um, I'm good now. So, that's the blending assignment. Your third and final component to certification is that you need to 
do an exam and it's uh, there's a written exam and a clinical exam so your clinical exam you could just videotape and submit it to us and it's the last of your 55 clinicals so essentially 55 clinicals tape your last one and send it in if you can when you're taping just give me one arm one leg one foot and of course the back and the lymphatic drainage and facial but um, I don't need to see both legs I mean if it's in there it's in there whatever okay I'm just gonna watch your first one though <laughs> and then your um, written exams we're gonna give you a mock exam and 70% of the exam questions are on there so this is built to support you and it's built for you to know the most important safeties and concerns so that's why the exams there all right those are your three arguably four with your video components to certify for this program let's get started with essential oils and aromatherapy essentially aromatherapy is the balancing of the physical spiritual by using a calculated application of plant essences of pure plant essences so we're rebalancing body mind and spirit with essential oils that are pure plant essences in various calculated applications so various parts of the plants that they come from um, this is as of course is an aromatherapy definition an exam question so is this one so eight parts of the plant that the essential oils come from they can come from the flower the blossom itself the rind so the citrus rind um, all your citrus come from rinds and they can come from the root uh, from the bark from the seeds from the leaves from the branches and from the somebody yelling at me resins there we go thank you I needed to so just essentially break down the plant from the top to the bottom um, if I would have done that in order that would have helped me visualize it all right either going from the root up or from the seed down um, there's nothing added to essential oils essentially they are purely extracted from that plant material there's a few different ways they can do that so in your manual you have various there's four main ways of distillation steam and hydro distillation are really the most common ways and then we have um, some atmospheric compressions that that um, are used in the compressed distillation or atmospheric pressure distillation and there's also uh, cold extractions and cold extractions can be done with different solvents so you could use an alcohol a co2 um, those are pretty common methods of extraction and essentially most plants I mentioned we're done with steam distillation so if you've had, if you have a vat visualize a really large vat and they put a whole bunch of plant material in there let's talk about uh, rose or how about peppermint either or fill the vat with that and then fill it with steam and it goes through a cooling coil at the bottom where it taps out into two different sections and one section um, as it goes through that cooling coil it separates oil and water so one section is your distillate your floral distillate and that's also known as a floral water or a hydrosol so you have rose water every queen throughout history used rose water to tone their skin tighten their pores and prevent aging uh -huh. rose water distillate also known as a floral water a distillate or a hydrosol that's a byproduct of distillation of the essential oil it carries minute trace particles of that essential oil and it's in a water base um, so you can't make a trade shows people often ask me did you make the rose water and you're not adding rose essential oil to water to make rose water that is not a rose water that's the beginning of a perfume missing some components to actually anchor it um, but oil and water separate as you know so this is a byproduct and and then of course the other coil is your essential oil that byproduct is used repetitively in that essential oil process they keep putting that water back in that floral water and it gets stronger and stronger so it's about maybe three percent of an essential oil would be in there I think I'd seen something like that um so that's hydrosols that come from distillation 
And then if we talk about essential oils themselves and what are the various applications that we can use them in, there's so many different applications. So I'm just going to rhyme off some of the more common ones. Um, one of my favorites is having a bath. And you might put 10 to 12 drops of essential oils in your bath. If it's a baby, you're just going to put one drop. One drop per age you are generally in a massage is what we talk about. Um, but in a bath, same thing. If you're one year old, I would just put one drop in. And to avoid that concentrated drop hitting them somewhere, um, I might stir it into milk as uh, essential oils are lipophilic. So they're, they are um, fat solubles. And so it can break down with fat. So if you add it to milk, it could break it down into a million little globules. Instead of having one drop, you'd have a lot of drops. So it's way less concentrated and um, safer. And if it's, uh, you could also do that with a carrier oil. So in most baths, you might just put avocado oil as a nice full fat and add your 12 drops, whip it into there, and then put it in the bath or give it a stir. Um, I like to add it to the oil first and then to the bath. So you've got a really good blend and the aromatics will really um, hold themselves well as well. They'll anchor well in the carrier. All right, so there's also, you know, you could put a drop of um, some kind of a citrus twist that you make or a, even just cinnamon on a toilet paper roll on the inside. And every time you pull the toilet paper, you get this nice fresh fragrance. And you can certainly put a drop on your vacuum. That's one of my favorite things to do when I vacuum is put either a pine or a cypress or a marjoram, some kind of an kind of earthy, leafy smell with some citrus. All citrus are uplifting antidepressants, so it's always nice to clean with those and get happy cleaning. So a couple of drops on your filter. If you have an ionizer, the filter on that, you could put it on. You could put it on your furnace filter. You could put a drop on a Kleenex, tape it to your fan, and when it's spinning, it's really emitting that smell through the room as well. Of course, if you have a cold or a flu, you might just put a pot of water on with maybe a couple of inches of water. Have your face six inches away from the water and put a towel behind you. Lift the lid off once it's boiling and close your eyes and <sighs> inhale that one drop that you might just put in of some kind of bronchial dilator. So maybe a eucalyptus, pine thyme, cypress, something like that. Yeah, some kind of a, all the trees tend to be really good as bronchial dilators. Peppermint, spearmint, uh, yeah, marjoram. I've already said that one. So what other applications do we have? Well, of course we have massage. And in massage, we're doing 12 drops in a back massage or maybe 20 to 30 drops in a full body massage. The variation in oil drops is because of one, their weight, and two, their sensitivity. So if you have somebody that's hypersensitive, whether that's because they have anxiety, nerve, anxious, PTSD, depression, uh, there's so many people that are anxious. Um, what I find is they need less because their system, their nerves are revving so fast that a little bit goes a long way. Their body's ready to act. It's ready for support. And um, so you might stick closer to the 20 drops for them. Whereas somebody that's used to using everything in a uh, really concentrated ways, whether that's in their cooking or, you know, even in the perfumes that they wear or essential oils that they wear, is it very strong and overpowering? If they're used to that, if they take a lot of meds, let's say, or they do everything kind of hardcore, then up to 30 drops. But um, yeah, between 20 and 30 drops, maybe two to four or five different essential oils that you blend together. The idea of blending your essential oils, especially for a massage or a bath, is that you're blending your stimulants together or your relaxants together. Generally, you don't want a stimulating bath, so you might leave the leaves out of your bath and a lot of the um, seeds, and certainly all of your hot oils are stimulating. So you're looking for more relaxation when you're generally having a bath and a massage. Um, so I usually avoid using things like peppermint or spearmint or anything that's too bright. Save that to wake them up after, you know, after it's time to go, after the massage is complete, or after the bath, if you need to get up and go to work, then maybe put some peppermint under your nose just to waft and bring a little bit more 
I don't know why I just keep saying peppermint, rosemary, pine, thyme, um, you know, any stimulating oils would be a great idea to use, maybe not in massage or bath, but more to get you going just before you're ready for your work or activities. So in massage, if you're using two to four or five oils, you're probably gonna use a citrus because it's really uplifting on the emotions. Although if it's summer, you don't wanna use citrus on the skin if they're um, sensitive to skin cancer or tend to be prone to that rather, um, as it tends to draw sunlight anyways. So maybe just have it on the diffuser and they can smell it and get the benefits of it being an anti-inflammatory and not on their skin. It tends to be really drying on the skin anyways. So if you are using on the skin, the two best, uh, as I mentioned, or I will be mentioning in another video uh, that I've already done, so it's at the front of my mind, is that because citrus are drying, the safest of the citrus, or the gentlest of them, is the bergamot, that's the FCF grade. It's actually got about 30 to 40% acids and esters. So it's a nice anti-inflammatory, aphrodisiac, and it is uh, stimulating the parasympathetic with some of that acids and esters in it, whereas most of the citrus tend to be stimulating uh, to the nervous system and more wakeful. So, And then the other one that's mild and relaxing is mandarin. M&M, I remember that mind game, so maybe that'll help you too. M&M, mandarin, mild, um, citrus. So say so the citrus, mild ones, bergamot and mandarin. And then you'll be adding a floral and a wood probably to your blend and maybe some kind of a resin to anchor it as well. If you're using citrus, they oxidize really quickly, so you might use more drops of them. And if you're using woods and resins, they are your anchors and they really make your blend last. So don't use too much of them. A little goes a long way. They'll develop a bouquet. And we'll talk about this today when we talk about making perfumes but they are really your anchor and um, I'm thirsty. You should never be thirsty. So if you ever think you're thirsty, just drink water. All right, so um, yes, you can use essential oils in a lot of various applications. Certainly if you're studying peppermint, thyme, pine, rosemary, basil, those are some of my favorites to study for mental clarity or for a hangover, same thing, those are fabulous. But again, those ones I might keep out of my bath or I might keep out of my massage just because it's not the intention, unless it's, you know, that I'm massaging somebody just before a race or just before they have some kind of an activity that they need to be awake and stimulated for. So, we talked about essential oils, the definition where they come from in the plant the distillation the byproduct of distillation and then we talked about various applications of oils there's so many more applications of oils um, I bet you you're already using them in many ways in your home maybe you're putting them in the washer or dryer or um, on that note I find they're better in the dryer than the washer and if you have a cloth I have these eco cloths in my dryer to prevent static and I just put a few drops on there and if you put something that's strong um, that'll save you money. So things like lemongrass is really bright and uh, so is any of your hot oils, but they might be too clean or too strong for your likes. Um, resins are really strong as well, so like patchouli or if you like that. Anyways, okay, so how to make a perfume. Let's go with the fun stuff, yeah? Uh, you might have a blue cobalt glass bottle or at least a glass bottle always should store your essential oils in glass and dark glass is ideal. So if it's not dark glass, it should be some kind of dark glass, a green glass, a brown glass. Um, store it away from sunlight, of course, to keep all essential oils intact for as long as you can to prevent the volatility. You wanna keep it in a dark glass with the lid on it at all times. So as soon as you take your essential oils and you take the lid off to make your blend, put the lid right back on. Don't put it down and grab another oil with the lid off. That's my pet peeve because you're just oxidizing the oils, right? As soon as oxygen molecules attach to it, it starts to lose its uh, effects and it starts to become more of a skin irritant when it starts to oxidize as well. So be careful with that. Put your lids back on right away and then uh, avoid moisture and sunlight and too much heat with it. So keep them in a dark, cool place. That's how to care for your oils. 
um, in this bottle. Ta-da! It might take you a month to make a perfume if you do it properly, but it'll be a strong perfume and it'll last a long time. So this is my favorite, Ode to India. It's a blend that I made with a lot of the oils that I import from India. There's cashmere flower and French, no, there's not French pani. There is cashmere flower, which is that beautiful vanilla cord-like root with a sweetness to it. Um, there's jasmine in here and Himalayan flower, champaka, and mandarin. And I think that's pretty much it. So you take your essential oils, you're always gonna add the base note first. We only talk about base notes in making perfumes, but essentially the base notes are your roots, resins, barks, and berries, the hardest parts of the plant. And they're the anchor. They're gonna hold the blend and so that it doesn't oxidize so quickly. They're very slow, so they last the longest. They take the longest to activate, but they last the longest, your base notes. And then your middle notes come from the middle of the plant, like the branches themselves and the leaves. And at the top of the plant, you'll have your fruit and your blossoms and they tend to oxidize a little bit quicker all right so if you're using your base note it's the first one that you drop in so that would be like a frankincense myrrh sandalwood cedarwood patchouli cardamom cinnamon vanilla cashmere uh, frankincense did i say that one those are your base notes fabulous base notes i probably missed some but you know essentially the woods resins barks and berries uh, they're going to hold your blend so you're going to put that in first and you're usually putting in a quarter of that to everything else unless you wanted a hippie rudy blend unless you're doing all the forest friends and then in that case you know go nuts with whatever feels right for you but try and start your perfume with less oils in it and then let it cure over time, as you let it cure by succussing, rolling, too volatile to shake, they're delicate chemicals, not volatile, sorry, they're too delicate to shake. So <clears throat> when you're making your blend every day, you're gonna roll it like this a hundred times and then set it. And it's basically got your 40 to 60 drops in 120 mils, or you can go more than that or less than that, it really depends on what oils you're using, but just to give you kind of a point, and then you have half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of an alcohol. And I use an isopropyl mistrate, which you might be able to get from, uh, FPI is a wholesale company, so I don't know if you can order from them unless you're ordering in bulk, but that's where I was getting mine from. And it's really, uh, the reason why I like that instead of just alcohol is it doesn't smell like alcohol, and it's the viscosity of it. It has a little bit of a, a carrier oil in it, I imagine, because it's got this slipperiness to it that's non-drying like alcohols usually are. That all being said, you could use vodka. Yeah, traditionally they used to use vodka, so you might just put half a teaspoon of vodka in, you'll have a little bit of an alcohol smell to it, but um, it's not the end of the world. You're gonna smell these beautiful blends anyways, so. Depends on where you are and what you can get your hands on. Um, but an isopropyl mistrate is beautiful to have about half a teaspoon of that in here with maybe 40 to 60 or 80 drops of your essential oils, maybe even up to 120 if you want something really strong or it's a lot of oils that are gonna dissipate quickly because they're citrus. If you're doing a citrus twist, you're gonna use a lot more citrus in your blends. So the first thing that you did was you added your base note to that and then go ahead and add your other essential oils, your citrus, if you're gonna use leaves and flowers. And it's really about which oil do you want to dominate and using more of those. And just note that within a month of curing, your base notes become five times stronger. So you might only put in, remember I said they're the anchor and they really do resonate. So over time, they're gonna get stronger. This will save you a lot of money in making perfumes, by the way, is curing them and letting them sit for a month. You'll use one fifth of the amount, if not less, than you would have otherwise because they really get a chance to um, dance with each other's chemistry and break, break down and create new bonds with each other. And that new bond is a, bouquet and so this is the essence of perfumery parfum 101 right uh, the only other thing that you're going to add to this is water and you don't add that until you're done your curation so keep it away from sunlight for the month of curation all what you have in here is your alcohol and your 
uh, essential oils, and you might put in a little bit of a carrier oil, especially if you used a drying alcohol. Yeah? So you might put in a teaspoon of a fractionated coconut oil. I like fractionated coconut oil in perfumes because it doesn't stain. And you know, a lot of times when I'm doing perfume, I have long hair. I want it to be in my hair so that the wind catches it and I smell it more often and I don't want my hair to look greasy. Although it might look greasy today, I do need a shower. <laughs> um, so that's your perfume 101. Have fun with it. Uh, if you need guidance, send me an email by all means. I am happy to suggest how many drops of each to put in, but really uh, develop a connoisseur's nose by playing with this yourself and experimenting as your likes are different than everybody else. And this perfume should be customized for you, for your likes, yeah? Have fun, enjoy it, and after a month, be careful adding your water. You wanna add a non-chlorinated water too, of course, but when you're adding the water, add it really slowly and use a funnel. If you add too much water, what's the first thing that comes out? That's right, it's your oil, because oil and water, you know, oil goes to the top. It's lighter than water. It floats on water. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about today was your poultice um, and making a compress with your essential oils. So one more application that's incredibly healing. We have hot oils, um, a B, three C's, a P, a G, and a T is my memory game for remembering the hot oils. So the B is black pepper, the three C's are cinnamon, clove, and camphor, the P is peppermint, T, thyme, G, ginger. Those oils are not great for people that have sensitive skin, avoid them. They're not great for children, avoid it with children. Contraindicated, should not use those on children. They're too strong, they can burn their skin, they're just too aggressive, they don't need that. Um, generally, you're using these hot oils in a localized application because they're all fabulous for deep-seated pain and arthritis. Um, so let's say you have a face cloth. You want to use a really thin one, so you use less of uh, less water in it, and it's dripping less. And you're going to take it, and I'll open it up first to that open area. And I'll take my essential oils. Let's pretend that in my water it's actually a, a teaspoon of oil. And in that teaspoon of oil, I'll add eight to ten drops of essential oils. Maybe some of them are these hot oils up to five drops hot oils in a compress, and then some other oils for pain. So I might have other anti-inflammatories in there like sandalwood, patchouli, cedarwood, vetiver, uh, yeah, juniper berry, uh, sweet marjoram. And then I'm gonna take that blend, imagine this is your essential oil blend with your carrier oil, and put it on your towel, the shape of the injury, the shape of the pain. So if it's a lower back, you're gonna zigzag, or if it's the abdominal area, zigzag, right? If it's a knee or an elbow, you might just do a small area and make a circle on that area. And then once you have that on there, fold it closed, and then twist it, and dunk it into hot or cold water. So generally, you're gonna do hot water as a vasodilator for pain and arthritis. If something just happened though, if it was an accident, I would do cold. Like if it's inflamed and throbbing, I want to take down the throbbing and that capsule is already full of interstitial fluid. So if I add heat, it's going to be a vasodilator. It'll increase heat to the area and that will pound it and make it worse because it's stuck in the capsule. There's no more space for it to go, so it starts to pound. So if it exacerbates their pain, switch. It's cold that you need but generally you're only using cold for an acute injury. So if something just happened, like you sprained or you strained something, or for tired, puffy eyes, you can always bring that down with cold. Or a migraine. Migraine, great cold. Otherwise you're using heat. So I'm gonna dunk this into a bowl of hot water. I just boiled water maybe with a kettle. And then I'm gonna open it back up and the open area, I'm gonna go ahead and compress that sore shoulder with. And then over top of that, I'll put a plastic bag and then a hot pack. Or if I did a cold, then I'd do a cold pack from the freezer, All right? Generally, these are phenomenal, compresses are phenomenal for drawing out pain really quickly to an area, temporarily drawing out that pain. And it's left on for about 15 to 20 minutes. 
So in that 15 to 20 minutes, in general, you're elevating that area above the heart because you want it to drain back to the heart. You want lymphatic fluids. If it's swollen, irritated, maybe the lymph is holding on some toxins in that area, and you want that fluid to move back and drain through the subclavian vein back to the heart. So elevating it, if it's not an area that's already above the heart, would be a great idea. So if it's your knee, your knee sit in a lazy boy with a pillow under your legs or lie in bed with two pillows under your legs so that your knee is above your heart. Yeah. Okay, so that was... Uh, Compresses and compresses and poultices can be very similar. Um, so I'm gonna talk about poultices next. So compresses are easy to incorporate into your massage. Go ahead and just pop your kettle on, have a bowl and um, a plastic bag ready. I shove the plastic bags under the legs of my table because nobody sees them and they're accessible when I need them. Maybe just a nice white kitchen bag under there and then, you probably just going to have linens in your treatment room anyways. So all you need is a bowl and a kettle and it takes a minute to prepare a compress. So if somebody has a really tight area, they come in, they say, you know, my lower back is, I'm in excruciating pain. I have a chronic area that's lit up. I'm going to start the massage by getting a compress ready and putting it on that area. And then I'll start into the back massage. Yeah. Or if it's a part of the back, I might heat that area up and start on the legs or I might do the compress after I've worked that area of the back out so I could assess what is going on with that area. Just um, in any event, there's not a wrong time to add a compress and you could do compresses multiple times a day. So a lot of our clients will buy the essential oils and take them home make their own compress blend, seeing how wonderful this is for their arthritis. It's fabulous for people to have arthritis in their hands and they want to knit or they want to sew, you know, they want to use their hands for undoing their buttons to go pee for God's sakes. So something really easy is to wrap that compress around their hands, put a plastic bag and let that sit for 15 to 20 minutes. It'll come out of there and yeah, their fingers will be able to play the piano with effortlessly. It's um, quite a fabulous little trick. Also, if you have hot stones, just go ahead and pop them in their hands. That's another fabulous way to draw out pain, although you're not getting the benefits of the essential oils there. So you might massage the oil onto their hand first and then give them their um, hot stone. So you get the vasodilation of the hot stone, increasing circulation to the area, and you have the benefit of the oils being absorbed as anti-inflammatory and, and analgesic, so pain relievers and taking down inflammation. Woo, maybe I'm not thirsty now. Maybe I just talk a lot. All right, last part of this day's lecture is I talk as a herbalist about a witch's herbal healing brew. And these are so simple to make. I don't know if you could see the ingredients. You can even take a screenshot of that maybe. But I'll tell you the ingredients. They're magical for sprains, strains, inflammation, pain. But I don't use these herbal bags for just anything. I'm using them for an accident. If you sprained or strained something in the last 48 hours, we can really help accelerate or they can really help accelerate the healing of their tissues internally as well. So even if you, you know, have in and internal bleeding, yeah, bruising is phenomenal for hematomas, which is those really bad bruises that get that hump to them. Or for fractures, phenomenal for fractures to accelerate the healing of bones. Did you know that if you use something like comfrey root and comfrey leaf, these herbs that um, I use around my uh, fruit trees as permaculture, so they're a natural fertilization, they come back every year, and it's okay to harvest a little bit because they come back every year. The leaves, you get to harvest at least two times a season, but the roots, that's a little bit trickier to get at and have them come back, right? Anyways, they accelerate bone growth, so they create this mesh, this matrix of the bones where they actually weave the bones together so that they're not susceptible to breaking again. That matrix has a really nice, strong, fortified system now. Whereas generally, when you break a bone, it comes back together like this with all this rigid scar tissue in it. And if you don't work that scar tissue out, you might have a, 
hypersensitivity to pain or maybe there's ne there's not neuralgia maybe there's dead nerves there and you don't even feel them anymore um you might have yeah continual issues and an ease to break an area again if it hasn't healed properly so this comfrey root that's in here and comfrey leaf is phenomenal to accelerate the healing of bones you can look into that it's um yeah it's something that if you're in in north america anyways you can certainly grow that and it I, you grow it around your fruit and your nut trees and it gives them a lot of i should know this i think it's nitrogen that it's the fixator for look that up let me know if i'm wrong um so this herbal bag has two tablespoons of comfrey leaf in it and it has two tablespoons of witch hazel witch hazel is a wonderful herb for healing bruises it's an astringent so it helps to heal the broken blood vessels and it tightens them back up and accelerates their healing so witch hazel phenomenal tonic as well they sell that you can get you know witch hazel distillate in a pharmacy right phenomenal for preventing aging and um, for closing the pores so some people use it as a tonic on their skin and we certainly do that with people that come into the spa if they have oily skin so witch hazel i love to use as an astringent for facials if you have oily skin if you don't have oily skin and i use it then i'm going to compensate by putting a maybe some avocado oil in their massage afterwards to re-moisturize because it can be very tightening and toning. So witch hazel, great for bruising. That's also in here. Rose hips, they're high in vitamin C, high in bioflavonoids. That's your anti-inflammatory. And when you couple the two of them together, the bioflavonoids with the vitamin C, you have an ester C. So it's a phenomenal, uh, easily absorbable, easily accessible vitamin C to accelerate healing to tissues, to take down inflammation, and to pr promote new cell growth. There's lavender and chamomile, both wonderful for sensitive skin, wonderful for inflammation and accelerating healing to damage tissues, especially skin. And there's calendula, also known as marigold in here, calendula and arnica two tablespoons of those. And calendula and arnica are fabulous for trauma. They are your trauma oils to accelerate the healing of a sprain or a strain. So a sprain is to a ligament. A ligament crosses a joint to support it so it doesn't hyperextend and it keeps the capsule in place. And a tendon is um, a strain, happens to a tendon. And a tendon connects a muscle to a bone. So if you pop a tendon, you might have, you know, let's say in baseball, you threw the ball so hard that you dislocated your shoulder. Um, uh, that's a sprain and a strain. So the capsule didn't hold into place, which caused the ligaments to have an overstretch. And ligaments don't tighten so well. So if you don't help tighten a ligament, it's lost its elasticity and you have the problem of hypermobility, hypermobility. So the joint comes in and out of place all the time. Um, and then a strain also happened there because it tore the muscle off of the bone. So when you overextend things or have too much force, your body tells you not to do something and if you override that, you can cause both a sprain and a strain. So, Arnica and Calendula are amazing for healing sprains and strains. As a matter of fact, if you go to your health food store, you can buy Tramiel, or I think Tramiel's now been bought out by somebody else, so it's called Trauma something, but it's an ointment cream. And if you ever have a sprain or a strain and you don't have one of our handy bags, we sell these for, I think, two for $50. They're phenomenal. Imagine how much time, if you save two weeks of healing, how much time is that that that's saving you on work? A lot of times people are told no weight bearing activity after, right after an injury and um, you know to stay off it and stay home and not to do activities that would cause or irritate it, which is great <clears throat> advice. Um, but if you're not helping to accelerate the healing of the tissue, that's a lot of time as most sprains and strains take three to six months to heal when nothing is done for them. So. This is the magic compress bag. I think I've rhymed off all the ingredients in them. They are in your manual. You can double check. But basically what you're doing is this keeps for two years on its own. It's a, an unbleached muslin fiber. I don't know if you could see that. And I've just tied it together at the top there. 
uh, yeah, you don't have to put it in this. I put it in because I don't have to strain the pot afterwards. But essentially, you're going to drop this into a pot, and then uh, the pot had boiling water in it. It might have been at least a gallon of water. As I drop it in, I'm going to take a wooden ladle and massage it every five minutes, turn the element down to low, and as I'm massaging this every five minutes with that wooden ladle, you're seeing it exude more and more color. It's ready when you don't see the bag anymore, which is about 20 to 30 minutes into it, depending how much water you've put in. Then that mixture is good if you store it in the fridge for a week. So depending on your injury, you're going to have leftovers or not the size of your injury so again you're using this cloth and saves you a lot if you have thinner cloths because you're using less of your poultice of your poultice tea your infusion now right so I'm gonna dunk this into the infusion if it just happened within the last 48 hours it's an acute injury so I'm gonna use ice I'm gonna use it cold it just came out of the fridge so I boiled it and steamed uh, I infused my tea and then I put it in the fridge and then I put it on cold or I need to use it right away so it was hot I put ice cubes and made it cold right and then after you've put this on for 20 minutes again over top of this you're putting your plastic bag so it doesn't drip and you're adding a hot pack or a cold pack we're using it cold for the first two or three days when it stops showing signs of inflammation you're good to use it uh, hot so signs of inflammation cardio Cardinal signs of inflammation are pain, redness, immobility, swelling, and heat. If you have those, you're always going to use it cold until those dissipate or disappear. And then you can start using hot. In the process, you can start doing a vaso flush. You can do hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold on day three or four. Again, depending on the signs of prish. And when you're seeing prish, the application is always rice. So that's a first aid thing. When you see pain, redness, immobility, swelling, and heat, you're going to use rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Yeah. So the rest is no weight-bearing activity. The ice is this cold compress, or you could use ice as well. On that note, if you're using ice, don't put it on a bone. You're going to put it around it, right? So you're going to make the donut. And you can make a donut if you don't have a, a pea bag that you can separate. So that's easier, right? Take a frozen pea bag and just separate the peas so there's no weight on the bone, but it's on the inflammation on the bursas. Or you could take this lovely towel, twist it, tuck it in like this, and freeze it. Pop it in the freezer, and it's your emergency donut for knees, elbows, and joints so that there's no weight on the joint itself. So that's applying your poultice or compress. So you can do them both together, right? As I put this on from my herbal infusion, I could add my essential oils to it for additional benefit and then pop that on. I'm gonna do this three times a day for an injury that's a sprain or a strain, or a hematoma or a fracture. If it's a fracture, of course, check with your doctor. Make sure that you um, have it rebroken or uh, put back into place if needed to be before we um, accelerate the healing of the tissues. And um, yeah, so 20 minute application, three times a day. If it's uh, a bruise, it should be gone within two days, three days, even if it's a bad hematoma, even if they usually last a month for you. It's phenomenal to see how fast this works. Do it once, you'll never forget it, and you'll use it on all your clients. I use Herbie's Herbs in Toronto to buy in bulk. So if you're looking to buy these herbs in bulk, you can reach out to Herbie's Herbs in Toronto and buy by the kilo um, for a really reasonable price. And make sure you're looking at where they grow from. So uh, my Arnica itself, I can get an Arnica from China for probably $15 a kilo. No offense to China at all, but they don't have great growing rules and they allow all kinds of things that are cancer causing in the soil. And not that we have the best growth in Canada and North America, but at least we have a couple of thousand chemicals that we've said, oh, those are cancer causing. We are not allowed to use them in our, in our growing. Um, so you can get that um, Arnica from Montana for $80 instead of $15. And I would highly suggest that. It's worth its uh, weight in gold for sure. 
These last two years, so we travel all over the world, uh, my son and I, and we bring two of these with us in each of our bags. One for one of us if something was to happen to us and one for taking care of somebody else as there's always somebody that we run into that's had an accident while we're traveling. So a nice dry bag, it's not activated until you um, activate it. And how I found out about these, not because I'm a herbalist, but because I had a home birth and my midwives gave me one of these. And when I looked at the ingredients, I made two more bags and I made these amazing pussy pops with them. They had encouraged me to use them in my bath. Uh, as a birthing bath, they give you a bag. And I took them and made this really strong decoction. And then, and that's what this is really. It's not an infusion, it's a decoction because we have roots and barks in there, some harder things. So we didn't just steam it. We had to have a light boil for 20 or 30 minutes. Anyways, so I put these on a, a cookie sheet that was full of maxi pads and I just poured them on the maxi pads and froze them. And these are the best pussy pops ever. If you've had a baby and you've torn, or even if you haven't torn, you're gonna be swollen. The vulva is tender and um, needs a little bit of attention. And so this is just like the best friend you could have for this, this time. I just love them. I, yeah, they really accelerate the healing, of course, but they feel good too. They really help to, um, yeah, to take away the swelling and accelerate that healing of those delicate tissues in that area so that you can sit even more comfortably. Mm -hmm. Okay, so remember that for your exam. Prish equals rice. In first aid, you're always going to rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Elevate meant above the heart. Compress was the compress. Ice is done cold, so we're not using heat in the acute stages. We're using ice, yeah? And that was anytime you see prish, which is pain, redness, immobility, swelling, and heat. So look at both sides, right? Pain, you're going to ask them on a pain scale of 1 to 10, 10 being excruciating. How how high is this on the pain scale and if we're above seven um yeah you make sure you have additional support and that they've seen somebody else of course but um you're going to ask this question every time you treat them on a pain scale of one to ten and you're going to see that within a couple of these applications it's incredible you can even see the discoloration of a bruise in 20 minutes get lighter and fade these, I'm telling you what, it's no essential oils in here. <laughs> it's just something, it's really sad when people are taught to walk away from people when they're in pain. Oh, that's out of your scope of practice. Eh? As a graduate of massage therapy, I was told to turn people away if they have um, sprains or strains. No, we don't work on them. But if you come to see me, I can work on it. I just can't manipulate it because it's in an acute area. So it's contraindicated to work on physically anything below the area that's acute, right? So if it's here, I can't work on your arm or hand that day. No massaging that. It's contraindicated because I'm increasing blood flow through this area. And remember I said it's a that capsule is full of interstitial fluid because of the injury to protect it. And so if you bring heat to the area, it's going to exacerbate it. And there's nowhere for it to go, so it pounds and it gets worse. So you're exacerbating their pain by working on any area below an injury is contraindicated. Remember that. If they come in, something is swollen, they dislocated their knee, I cannot work below your knee that day. I can't do your foot because I'm going to make the knee worse. But that doesn't mean that I have to turn you away and then I don't treat the area of pain. I just don't treat it topically with a physical manipulation. These horrible bags are a godsend. So I do, like I said, charge for them because there's a cost involved in you buying these. Um, so you might sell these to your clients. Certainly we have a lot of people that uh, once they've used it once, they just want to have them on hand so that if something else happens or if they're coming out of surgery or whatever, they have that support to accelerate the healing to their tissues. Um, yeah, so I just thought I would share that with you as it's uh, pretty profound. And going through pain, redness, swelling, heat, and immobility, and I said check both sides. I mean, like the redness, look at the left side and look at the right side, and then you'll know, oh yeah, that's really red compared to his normal side. Or for the immobility, what does that joint do? Oh, the arm itself does abduction. Help, I'm getting abducted by an alien. Would you say help? I don't know. But anyways, that's abduction, where the arms are going away from the midline. Adduction, they go towards the midline. The arm also does um, forward and back. I can't even think of 
<laughs> these terms, and rotation, right? So do the movement that that joint does on the good side, see how that works, and then do it on the bad side. Go, oh, there's a real reduction in range of motion there for sure, right? That's how you can tell. And it's the same thing with swelling. You might not be able to push around an area and really know to how different the interstitial fluid is when it puffs up if it's not too swollen. You might not be able to tell unless you look at the good side and the bad side and go, geez, actually that knee is double the size. There's a lot of swelling going on there. Yeah, so check the good side and the bad side. And the same with the heat, right? Feel with the dorsal of your hand, the back of your hand, palar, is what you feel heat with. And so feel heat on the good side first. Oh, that temperature, that's normal. And on the bad side, and go, oof. Okay, that's really got a lot of heat. There's a lot going on in that area. We can't work on that area, but we will ice it because of all of that. All of that means I love you. Take care. If you have any questions, um, send me an email. It's been my pleasure. Again, welcome to the course and I look forward to seeing you in the next class, which will be your chemistry class. Take care. Be well.